Okay, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's How to Slam Your Exam event. Thank you all, um, thank you all for attending this and those who are watching this online. So my name is Paul Nicolaitis, the Education Director for the LSS, and I would like to begin this workshop by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples very today. Weird full stop. And sovereignty has never been seceded and be right, it always will and always will be Aboriginal land. So tonight we're joined by Grace Orange, Alexander Hughes, Andrew Ferres from the Peer Mentoring Program and Zoe Wandenberg from the Juris Doctor Program. Just enter. So before we start this exciting and very beneficial workshop, I would like to provide just some housekeeping rules. So you are more than welcome to keep your camera on throughout the, the event. However, I would like to add that you do not put your microphone outside of asking questions during the Q&A session just at the end. Um, and this session will be recorded for future years and reference for students. So if you do not wish to be seen during these recordings, please switch off your camera. Um, if there are any issues or concerns, please do not hesitate to contact me either by messaging the chat so in Zoom or by emailing me at education at RMIT LSS. So without further ado, Grace Orange, um, you can start your presentation. Cool, thanks Paul. Um, are we sharing the slides? Oh, yep, just let me get that sorted. Cool. All righty. Is everything good to go? Yeah, great. Um, Perfect. So maybe just pop onto the next one. Great. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Grace. Um, I, <laughs> sorry, I thought that, um, sorry, I just need to access my notes properly. Um, cool, so uh, I, I'm Grace. <laughs> I also want to start by acknowledging that I'm calling in from Wurundjeri country this evening. Uh, and I'd like to reiterate false sentiments that this land still belongs to Aboriginal people. In our study of the law, we learn what it means that sovereignty was never ceded. Aboriginal people had laws and customs long before invasion that are not recognised in our legal system. There is no national Aboriginal voice to parliament enshrined in our constitution, and Aboriginal people continue to experience the trauma of colonisation today. With this in mind, I want to pay my deep personal respects to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander and South Sea Islander people who may be attending today and extend a very warm welcome to you. Uh, it's really wonderful to see so many of you attending tonight, so thank you for coming along. We hope that this session will um, help calm any nervousness that you might be feeling in the lead up to your exam. Um, so first, I just want to plug the peer mentoring program. Um, so that's basically a program that connects law students um, with mentors like me, Alex and Anders, who have already completed and done well in our first year um, subjects. So through the program, we support you to develop the skills to succeed in law school. Um, it can include general academic advice, understanding course content, how to approach assessment tasks, noting of course that we can't directly answer assessment questions for you, but we can point you in the right direction and share resources that have helped us in the past. And relevant to today's session, of course, uh, how to prepare for your exams. So if you like what you hear tonight and you'd like to book a one-on-one, -on -one, head to Vigo and sign up. Um, I can share the link with you in the chat once I finish speaking. Um, and FYI on the peer mentoring program, because it is week 11, some mentors are wrapping up for the semester, um, but they'll be updating their availability on the platform. So I still encourage you to sign up. Um, I'm personally still available, except on exam or work days. So um, some disclaimers to begin with. We want to make the point that exam notes are highly individual. So what works for you may not work for another person. Um, and that said, what works for us may not work for you. But in this session, we are sharing what has, has helped us personally. And we hope that uh, you can take a thing or two from each presenter and develop your own style. While we have some great tips, it is always best to check with your lecturer um, what they expect when you're, when you're answering an exam question. Um, for example, when I did the Fundamentals of Contract Law course, my lecturer said not to mention the facts from the cases, like the flick knife in the window when I'm addressing an invitation to treat and to focus instead on the principle from the case. But in different classes, my lecturer preferred that the facts were included along with the principle. 
So that's just one thing that I've had to look out for that's varied between classes. So make sure that you always check with your lecturer what they're expecting from you. It is always best to write your own notes. Um, note sharing websites are not recommended because they could contain incorrect or incomplete information. Um, and this is also a good time to stress that the examples that we're sharing with you tonight are just to give you an idea of structure and different approaches. They should not be replicated in your own work. Um, and we remind you to always have academic integrity at the front of your mind. Finally, make sure that you um, practice answering questions with your notes because that's the best way to assess whether they work for you. And I think Anders is going to talk some more about that later. So um, moving on to my top tips. So I always structure my notes by issue. And by that, I mean the issues that could be in contention in the court of law. So for thoughts, think battery or battery in a medical negligence situation. For criminal law, it would be a particular offense. Um, and for contracts, it would be like a request for information or privity. You basically um, want to set out the relevant law and the tests and anything that you need that you know you need to address if you get that question um, on the exam like if, if you're supposed to address that issue and word it in such a way that you can copy and paste that section into the exam so i'm talking about issue and rule there um, i always use sentence starters and highlight the words that i know i'm going to need to change in the exam so um, for example, it's plaintiff and defendant, um, and I know that if it's highlighted in blue, I just double click that and quickly change defendant to Grace or G. Um, I do write out the rules in my own words, again, in such a way that I can paste them in. Um, you're usually awarded the most marks applying the law to the fact situation that you're given. So structuring your notes like this gives you more time to do that. In my notes, I also underline and highlight the case name so that it's really obvious to whoever is assessing the exam that I have referenced it appropriately. Uh, and then a last point is um, to use the Microsoft Word headings because they help you to navigate your notes in the side panel. Uh, and this is actually really helpful. Like you might rely on control F, um, but that won't, like if you've got um, like the word negligence scattered through your notes, uh, a simple control F won't take you to the issue of negligence. Um, and I've also just lost something else, sorry. Uh, so next slide, please, Paul. So this is an example. Um, da -da -da, sorry, this is an example that I put together um, to show how I structured my notes for criminal law. So. What I've tried to do here is make it really clear that you can have what's called, um, what I call a mini IRAC within an overall IRAC. Um, so for a criminal law question, there is always a principal issue of whether the defendant will be held criminally liable for some offence. Uh, then the elements are a bit like a checklist of issues that need to be addressed in order for you to conclude on that principal issue. So you do a mini IRAC for each element and conclude by saying whether they are likely or unlikely to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt. Most elements will have uh, some case law explaining the tests and rules that you need to apply to decide whether that element is satisfied or not. And you have these ready to go in your notes. In green, uh, I show, I've shown where you analyze the facts in the exam scenario. This is the most important part of your exam because this is where you show that no matter what situation you're thrown in the real world and in the exam, you can use your legal knowledge and skills uh, to argue a case make sure that you weave in the facts from the scenario and match them to the relevant element. For example, if your defendant has stabbed someone, you can pretty quickly check off voluntariness by saying that their conduct of stabbing the victim was not accidental or reflexive, and thus it is likely uh, to be found to be voluntary, and then move on. Your analysis for some elements may be brief if the issue is unlikely to be in contention in a court of law. Spend more time on the issues that could be argued either way. And remember, some exam questions are designed so that you can argue them either way. It's important not to spin your wheels on these questions. Um, make sure that you support your argument with the facts and the law. Tell the reader why you think that the facts do or do not support a finding that the element is satisfied. 
and come to a reasoned conclusion. Um, for example, if your defendant has, some, has said something like, I don't want you in my life just before the victim ultimately dies, this fact may be relevant to determining whether the mens rea is likely to be proven beyond reasonable doubt. So you copy in your notes, which include the rule from Crabbe's case, which says that the mens rea is likely to be, sorry, is satisfied if the defendant intended or was reckless as to causing death or grievous bodily harm. Then you include what the defendant said about not wanting the victim in their life and any other relevant facts and discuss whether this is enough evidence to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant intended for the victim to die or be caused grievous bodily harm. Don't forget, of course, to address recklessness if you need to, and then conclude. Um, I'm going to repeat one of my tips to emphasize it, uh, and that is to always bring in the facts which are relevant to the element or issue that you are addressing. So don't discuss the words, I don't want you in my life, under actus reus elements. The fact is relevant to uh, mens rea, so discuss it there. Uh, and then lastly, just conclude on the principal issue. I would always use qualified language, um, like likely or unlikely, because you never know uh, what the judge is or jury is going to ultimately decide. You may, of course, need to move on to the next defence in a criminal law context. For example, if the jury finds the defendant is not guilty of murder, they may still be held criminally liable for manslaughter. So basically rinse and repeat this process with manslaughter. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty high level overview of my top tips. Um, I do want to say that I am available to share more tips with you or go through any of this with any of you in more detail um, if you sign up to buy and book session. Um, I, if I don't hear from you though, um, I really do wish you all the best and I hope that you have fun in your exams. Um, I do think that there's kind of a bit of a thrill in smashing through your exam in a couple of hours and you will feel great when it's done. Um, so best of luck to you all and I need to hand over now to Alex. Hello. Uh... After going off to Grace, uh, I'm Alex. I am doing an engineering degree and a business degree, which is a bit different from everything else that everyone's doing here. Um, but I have done commercial law previously. My main tips for the exams are make notes. It can be very, very helpful during exams to prepare notes as it makes it easier when writing down stuff and when you're in the heat of the moment to focus and actually apply them. Because I know personally, when I'm sometimes a bit stressed in the exam, being able to just look at my notes quickly and access uh, the rules applying for certain cases can be extremely helpful. My main note, my main tips for exam notes are to make them clear and easy to access um, and fully break the key down, the key topics for your notes, outlining the key rules and the cases and the legislation. As I hope you already know your cases, you shouldn't really need to explain all of them in detail, but just make them in the format which is easy to access quickly, see, oh, that's an element uh, for a certain case and be able to quickly just put that in. Um, as there'd be massive amounts of uh, important cases for a lot of areas such as contract formation, but you want to have the specifics for each of them, maybe like agreement or intention or certain other things. It also helps to break, break down these sections into elements. For contract formation, for example, you can break that into agreement, intention, and consideration. Now, for when you answer your exams, I personally like to read through the information fully once just to get a full understanding of the situation. And yeah, as usually there's a lot of information in there sometimes which you might not think is relevant but is relevant or sometimes you just want to get a full idea of what's actually happening in the situation. Then after that, I would like to go through my work and then highlight the key words, making sure I understand that these key points are actually relevant to the topic. Then that means when I go back and finally write it, I've understood the case fully, I know what's key and I know what I can relate to my chosen areas. Um, it might be different in certain things with certain topics, but overall, that's a very good gist of how to do it. Um, similar to Grace, I also like doing mini IRACs for answering stuff. Um, for me personally, I like doing it for each element of chosen topics um, as they make you, and making them my issues. It is, however, different for each type of law, um, and it can not work for some other parts, but overall, having mini IRACs for each separate issue of a case, as there should be multiple issues sometimes in there, um, can be very, very helpful and very easy to understand it and break it down. Make sure to have headings and subheadings and stuff like that so it's easier for the examiner to read your information. As sometimes it can be very difficult for the examiner if they can't read your stuff properly. When they're able to read your information properly, it makes it easier for them to mark it and essay just, yep, that's there, that's there, that's there, and tick, tick, tick. And hopefully you can do well. 
Now, finally, when you're struggling to answer questions, my best option for that is to actually just write them yourself. Um, it sounds simple, but I know personally when I'm coming to exam questions for certain subjects, um, they can be asked a certain specific ways to answer them and certain particular things to do. The best thing to do is to write your answers, paint how you think they would work, then provide them to a tutor or a course coordinator. They will be able to give you key feedback, maybe give some markups and tell you what is exactly you should do, what's good, but what doesn't work and what's like what they would like. Because it's different for each subject and no matter how well one subject might be wanted, um, another subject might want it completely differently. Um, and then, if uh, Paul, would you be able to go to the next slide? Uh, this is an example of something my notes is. So what I like doing is I actually like making kind of like <laughs> a table of contents for my notes. So I have a section for each of my contract. This is um, an example of contract law uh, for intention, uh, agreement, and all that. Um, and I find it easy to first have my elements, which is my agreement, my intention, my um, consideration. And then from there, you just go in the specifics and have the key cases for each of them. So it becomes very, very easy to access it and put what you want to do in there. Secondly, um, I like having a checklist. A checklist can be very, very helpful for each of your cases because a lot of cases, they require certain few cases or certain things to work for it to actually go through. And so it can be very helpful just to have that say, yep, everything works here, this is all good. Um, now you just go to the next part. Then you don't need to focus it. You just need to focus as long as it fulfills these criteria, it works, now I go to the next part. And uh, that's about it for me, I think. Um, and I hope you can uh, do well in your exams as I know you can be very stressful, but as long as you take it calmly, understand it, and you've read the cases and understand stuff, it shouldn't be too hard. Just take your time calmly, apply the rules, integrate it like Ray said, and you should be able to do very well. Um, and I hope you all do well on your subject. I'll give it to uh, Anders for now. Thanks, uh, Alex, for that. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anders. And straight up, I do want to say that I'm not a particularly details oriented person. I don't color code my notes. I don't use convoluted systems or take an intense bullet journal style approach to studying. Full credit to you if you do. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm not organized uh, either. So my biggest tip in note writing and something that we've already heard, uh, heard about a couple of times is to really uh, reiterate IRAC. Uh, consider what your examiner wants and then use this to inform how you write your notes. So most of our teachers uh, in law, they're reiterating IRAC again and again and again. They're not simply reiterating the R bit. So your notes shouldn't either. So instead of just sort of restating the law that I've learned, um, I, I like to think ahead and think about how all the bits connect together. Think about how the legal principle of a case, for example, would be relevant to a real person. And if you do this, while you're writing your notes, then you're thinking about how to use the law that you're learning. You're going, well, this is what I could be examined on, and this is how I can put an argument together using what I've learnt. And that is the key skill for a lawyer, learning how to use the law, not just learning the rules themselves. Um, as, uh, as we've discussed, there are a lot of marks to be found. In fact, I'd say most marks, I think, certainly many marks in an exam in the A part of IRAC. So with my notes, I anticipate counter arguments. And remember that not all cases simply stand for one principle. There might be uh, ways to use the same case to argue two different ways, um, which I'll show you guys in, in my example uh, in a second. Um, and also my final bit of advice here would be that the best way to check if your notes are good is to road test them. So don't just sort of read them again and again and again. Um, past exams, books such as LexisNexis Q&As are a great source of problem questions. And uh, it's really worth seeking out problem questions, answering them with your notes uh, without uh, you know, going to Google or anything else, and then take some time afterwards to reflect. Were there parts of the question that you missed entirely? 
Did you get a legal principle wrong? Have you forgotten to include a key case? Uh, you only really find that out by doing, and then you improve your notes accordingly. Um, and if your teacher, as Alex said, if your teacher says I'd be happy to look over a sample problem, then I 110% um, recommend taking them up on that offer. That can be a really great way uh, just to see how you're tracking. So, Paul, if you can go to the next slide, I'll show um, the beginning of an example. So this brief example shows what I mean. It's taken from my advanced contract law notes. And I've framed the content we learned in class as a series of questions to ask myself after I read the exam question. If I answer yes, then I go to the relevant section of my notes to find the law we learned set out and ready to apply. So I've already written my notes to be useful to me in an exam situation. I've got this, the only reason I'm writing the notes is for the exam. So that's my notes are in fact telling me what to do in the exam. So past Anders has basically told future Anders what he needs to be doing. Uh, down the bottom here, you'll see I've bolded a reminder to myself here, remember election and, and an exclamation mark. And I put this in because I found myself forgetting that you have to elect to terminate a contract. It doesn't just happen. So that was an easy few marks that I discovered through answering a practice question I had forgotten about. So putting it in my notes meant that if termination came up in the exam, I wouldn't miss the key issue of election as well. So this is a nice remember, I guess, a nice reminder, I guess, that uh, your notes are for you and you alone. Uh, it's totally fine to include comments to yourself, really, whatever works, um, because only you will be seeing them. Um, Paul, if we can go to the next slide. I'll just show, so let's assume the exam question says party A contracts with party B to deliver 10 kilograms of potatoes. Party A delivers eight kilograms instead. Party B argues this is a breach of a condition. So already there are two hints here. The first is that breach of a condition is relevant. And that was question two in my notes. So I read this problem. I see, uh, I ask myself if there's a breach of a condition. There is, because it's, it's dated there. So I didn't go to that section of my notes to guide my answer. The second hint is that the question mentions a specific volume or amount of something. And I can sort of vaguely remember that in class, it was a case which mentioned a dispute about volume. I can't quite remember exactly what that was, what the details were. I couldn't even tell you, you know, uh, yeah, what the principle of the case was, but that doesn't matter because I've written stellar notes. So past Anders anticipated that future Anders might need to remember this. So I go to the breach of condition section of my notes, and that would be laid out in a similar way, I think, to the way uh, Grace showed uh, her notes were laid out, all the rules uh, set out in a very accessible manner. I'd be careful not to skip all of that stuff and would probably use that for the bulk of my answer. But then I would find towards the end of this section of my notes that I have included uh, a little case summary here, which includes this, uh, which says, if a written contract specifies an amount, volume, measurement, et cetera, that is a condition, Arcos and Renarsen. And I've got two quotes here from Lord Atkin. A ton does not mean about a ton, exception, no doubt there may be microscopic deviations, which businessmen and therefore lawyers will ignore. So the reason I include both quotes here is because it then becomes useful for me to argue either way if I need to. I've got the key legal principle that the case stands for, uh, which is that uh, a ton does not mean about a ton. So it's a condition uh, of the contract. But then I also have this wriggle room here. I have this exception in case the facts, you know, invite me to argue the exception uh, or for any other reason it might come in handy. So, so yeah, that's my, my general approach to note taking. Um, and yeah, the key thing to remember, if I could only reiterate one thing, would be that many, many of the marks and exams come from applying the law, not simply stating the law. And I think it's really worthwhile to then design your notes so that they encourage you to do that in applying uh, when the time comes. In fact, they force you to do that applying. So, you know, whether you take my approach of setting questions, whether you have model answers, whatever approach works for you is fine. Um, but your notes should really be more than just a long list of rules. You've got to make it so that they, yeah, so they essentially force you to argue the law on the facts that you've given. 
uh, that's my that's it for me. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Zoe, who I think has a very different style of note taking. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So can everybody see that? Is that all right? Is that working? Cool. Hopefully this will work. Yay, it's working. All right. So thank you very much um, for, for what you said there, Anders, because I have exactly the same sort of approach in terms of writing all of my notes based on um, what future Zoe is going to need in the exam. So I have um, basically created a visual um, approach to this. So lots of people learn in different ways. Lots of people remember in different ways. So going back to what Grace was saying earlier about, um, you know, what works for you might not work for us and, and vice versa. Um, this is another way that you can do it in terms of memory triggering um, because it uses a different part of the memory center of your brain which allows you to um, tap into that um, more effectively if that's the way that you learn better so the first thing that i look at is um is doing a flow chart so all of my notes um, is based on flow charts and I came up with this idea, I'm sure many, many other law, um, law students have done it before me um, during criminal law, because I realized that there was really quite a process that you go through. Um, and I really wanted to have one of those, you know, like Google Forms with the logic in it, where if, you know, like choose your own adventure, um, if the answer is yes to this, then go to this box, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I tried to create it visually. Um, so the first part of trespass to goods would be, does the act involve a good? Um, and I always include a definition of what that means in the flow chart. And then I include um, some case point, um, some case notes. So put the names of the cases in, for example, and then put some dot points in. This is just a very basic approach to this. My actual flow charts are very, very detailed. Um, so all of the information that I need is going to be in that um, in that flow chart. So I don't have to go flicking through notes or anything. It's all on the one page. Um, so that gives me an understanding of what the cases are that are going to be relevant to me determining whether or not the item in question is actually a good. So if the answer is no, it's not a good, then that fails. But if the answer is yes, then I have to go to the next question, which is, was the defendant's act positive? If the answer is no, then it fails. If the answer is yes, then you go on to the next part. So then that next part's about, you know, directly causing physical interference um, with the plaintiff's exclusive possession of the tangible goods. So what does physical interference mean? What's possession or ownership? And I look at the definitions for those things and there's case law around, um, you know, different examples for that as well that I will include in the flow chart for the exam too. Um, so here we've got some of the examples of cases that you can include. So there's the everyday contact rule, the exclusive possession rule. Um, and these principles I always highlight in bold and I underline them so that when I'm casting my eye over, um, you know, the, the case note boxes um, in my panic in an exam because I've spent 25 minutes too long on the first question, which I always do, um, I can quickly hone in on what the principle is that I need to look at. So if the answer is no, then it fails. If it's yes, then we go on to the next question. The next question is, you know, about intention. So that's also to do with obviously negligence and, and recklessness. Not that that's, you know, the details aren't relevant here. But um, if the answer is no, then it fails. If it's yes, then we go on to was there a defence to the right of, of the third person? And so then that goes on to another question. Um, you know, if yes, then fail. If no, then we move on to the final part here. We just did the plaintiff have actual or constructive possession. No, you fail. Yes, go to international torts defence. Sorry, intentional torts defences, which is now another flow chart. So what you have is actually a process that has been visually represented um, and allows you to go step by step by step with all the information that you need at each point. So the, the definitions that are relevant to each question and the cases that are relevant to each question within that, um, you know, the, the tort in this case or the, um, the crime, et cetera, if you're looking at criminal law or contract details, if you're looking at contracts, um, 
you know, they're, they're all connected up and it's relevant. So I don't have to go flicking through my notes to try and find the right information. So you'll see, you know, with, with the notes that Anders made and the notes that Grace made, um, they're all the same information is there. It's just been represented differently. So for me, I find that I remember things better and I can, I can remember where something is in my notes better if I've set it out visually and I've done it in a way that's a process. So for me, this kind of thing works. Um, I also always include a legend. So I'm color coding the boxes. So the, the pink boxes are the case notes, the yellow boxes are the um, definitions, the blue boxes might be defenses, um, the gray boxes are the questions. Um, normally the green boxes are legislation. Um, you know, I also have different shapes mean different things and, and that sort of thing. So the more you get into it, the more detailed um, the process is. And you'll find that um, when you start or if you decide to go through this process, you'll find your own way of doing things. Um, when I was doing criminal law to begin with, um, I wrote out all my notes manually and I also um, did the flow charts and spent till three or four o'clock in the morning trying to get everything done because it was just too much work. I was essentially doing my notes twice. Um, when I got to contracts and, and torts, um, I just went straight into the flow charts and I did everything in the flow charts and it was much faster. And it meant that when it came to exam time, all my exam notes were done um, because that was how I'd learned it. And having that visual representation of it in my head um, while I was learning it also meant that I was focusing on the process as well. All right, so how can you build these? Um, there's lots of different ways. I started out with Microsoft Word. Um, Microsoft Word drives me up the wall. Um, you know, you are trying to put bullet points in and suddenly you've created a new document. It's, it's, it drives me crazy. But um, that is certainly an option. Um, I actually use Lucidchart. Lucidchart um, has, a, has a paid membership um, version, which I have, I think it's something like 15 or 20 bucks a month or something, just because I want to have um, access to lots of different documents and all, all of those sort of things. So each of these rep, um, recommendations will come with a different um, payment schedule or um, free levels as well. They've all got free memberships too. So Miro is another one. Um, Creately is another one, Coggle, you can also use Microsoft Visio, or of course Microsoft Word or Publisher if you're game. And there's also many, many more. If you actually do a Google search for alternative to Microsoft Visio or alternative to Lucidchart, you'll find that, um, that there's lots and lots of things that you can look at, lots of different options for you there. So in summary, Create a legend, use colours to maximise the visual memory triggers. If you're a visual person and the flowchart sort of connects to you, um, then using the colours will mean that the different sections will actually stand up. When I did crim um, criminal law, for example, all of my um, actus reus were in green and all of my mens rea were in red and I did legislation in blue. So um, it was just a different way of, of colour coding it. Make sure that the diagram flows so that way your problem solving process connects with how you write it up. So just like what the others have said with your IRAC methodology and doing mini IRACs within the bigger IRACs with all your babushka dolls and they say law is not easy. They weren't wrong, were they? Um, so if, the, if you are able to do it in a way that makes sense, then as you write, as you go through the flow chart and as you write the answer, you'll be going through each step in the flow chart. So it makes sense. Um, include cases and trigger notes so that you can remember what it is that you need to say, include definitions um, and make sure that you include case notes with dot points in there. So um, it's something that you'll be able to go, oh, that's right, that's the one where the dude did the thing um, and you'll remember what it is. And then finally, if you're in a subject where um, legislation is relevant, then um, include it in the process, of course, and reference everything. So when you're doing your um, cases or when you're doing your legislation, make sure that you've got, um, you know, the, the year that goes with the case. Make sure that you've got the legislation as well that goes with the, you know, the sections and what have you. Um, 
Sometimes I'll put the whole case, um, you know, information in so that I can find it if I'm using it for a research essay. Um, other times I just use the just use the year because I can then Google it based on that. Um, so that's that's me. I'll stop sharing now and um, hand back over to Paul. Well, thank you, Grace, Anders, Alex, and Zoe for everything that you've shared. Um, it's been really beneficial. It's, yeah, it's been really good to have different perspectives on how to organise your notes, how to organise information, um, and all those other fun things. Um, now, we now have a chance for everyone to ask any questions. This is our little Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, please let us know, and we'll be happy to answer it as best as possible. I'll get us started with a question just in case everyone's just like still warming up. It's totally fine. Uh, what would your advice be if, um, let's say it's SWAT back week, it's the end of SWAT back week and I've got an exam on Monday and maybe I am just the world's worst law student and I've done nothing uh, this whole semester, constitutional law, I'm looking at you. Um, what would your advice be? Where, where would you sort of start if it's the end of semester and everything's just bad? <laughs> No pressure, I'll open that up for anyone. I'll jump so in. with you so being I... like a time machine. <laughs> well, uh, I, of definitely course. time machine. Definitely. I look at past exams and look at how they ask questions and use that as my springboard. Um, look at the kind of things that they're asking for and focus my study around that and organize resources so I can tap into it for the exam. I would uh, just add to that, that if you're just so overwhelmed and don't know where to begin, um, legal publishers like LexisNexis, Thomson Reuters have like the, like egg, what are they, guides. like in a nutshell, the nutshell guides, which will give you the very basic rules that you'll need, but you're not going to go well if you leave it to the last minute. But, you know, there, there are resources. Totally like fine. That. You'll be fine, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> I guess actually that touches on an interesting point, which is what I personally have found, which is that I learn the material when I'm making my notes. That's when I, I will go for, for the hey. first few weeks, not quite understanding how it all fits or what's going on. But then once I sort of sit down and start doing the notes, that's when I, it actually sinks in for me. The penny dropped for me in my first year of undergrad where um, I suddenly realised, I don't know why I, it hadn't occurred to me before then, but um, I suddenly realised that the key to um, study is understanding, not remembering. So if you're able to go through that process and understand what it is that you are learning, then it becomes a lot less stressful and a lot less memory intensive when you're actually going through the exam prep process. And then in the exam itself, your brain is actually a little bit more relaxed, which means it doesn't tend to seize up in a massive panic um, when you're doing your exam, unless you're like me and you spend 45 minutes on the first question, which I don't advise. <laughs> um, but it's certainly a good way of being able to see if you can think about that process a little bit differently and really seek to understand the principles because once it makes sense to you it'll be much easier to apply i like it we have a question in the chat that's um from hannah that says uh what are your tips for note taking um and answering an, ex uh, an essay question I'm happy to have a bit of a go at this. And I'm assuming that this is in the context where you've got a bit more time than two hours, like usually for take, sorry, usually essay related exams, um, it's a take home exam. So you've got a bit more time. Um, my top tip is to plan your essay um, and use dot points. Um, so make sure that you've got sentence, uh, like sorry, paragraph uh, sentences, so like topic sentences, like paragraph is what I mean, sorry, um, so that you know exactly what you're arguing in that that um, paragraph. Then for doing research, if it's a research type essay, um, I actually use Excel to uh, organize my resources. So I'll have, you know, the um, name of the resource, the author, whatever, what kind of resource it is. And I actually summarize that resource as well. So in my own words, I put down like the five top things that this 
paper is telling me. Um, and then I link that to whatever paragraph it is that I was going to be using it in. So um, in that way, I kind of use Excel to structure my essay and then I weave it all together. So um, I think planning is really key for essays. Um, if it's a like a two hour situation, I suppose the best thing you could do is practice essays. <laughs> um, and that's like back to my year 12 days, that's what we did, um, you know, in upcoming to, um, you know, literature and English exam. Um, but yeah, it, it's hard to know because you never know what topic you're going to be thrown. You can only study um, yeah, what you've been taught in the, in the course um, and an essay might actually require you to, again, apply that. So that's what I have to say. Just um, uh, in terms of time management for research essays, I learned the hard way for me personally, that it's much better to do small bits of work over long periods of time than doing, you know, a full two day intensive right before the deadline. That's, that's just what I've uh, personally come to find. Um, and the RMIT library has this amazing resource where you plug in the due date for when your assessment's due and it gives you a, yeah, thank you, Grace. It gives you a full like schedule of like when you should hit every milestone for the things that you're writing. So I've found that to be very useful in terms of figuring out when to do little chunks of like, yeah, projects like that. Totally recommend, um, it's useful. Well, did we have any other questions from the form? Hey. Um, there was a question just regards to if you're in, in a situation where, you know, you're stressed and you can't really think of anything, what are some type of ways to just calm down and just get right back into the zone? Yeah, this is what I meant by not spinning your wheels. You just have to breathe and move on if you need to don't spend all your time on one question it's much better to score low on a few questions than you know not score at all on the rest that you don't get to so um yeah the the best thing to do is like practice in exam conditions um if you can set that up that up for yourself at home um and yeah just really stick to your time the other thing is the bullet point ideas so you don't have nothing, there's nothing more um, disconcerting than having a blinking cursor on a blank page for an exam as the time sticking down if you're on the computer or a blank piece of paper in front of you with the pen poised and you've got no idea what you're going to write. So sometimes just having a scrap bit of paper or a secondary um, document open um, to just jot down a couple of bullet points so you've got something to work from and then pad it out and go from there. Um, and then that kind of ties in with another question. How would you manage your time throughout the exam? I'm not going to answer this one because I'm terrible at it. I Look, I learned, the, and this I was just typing this in the chat, but I'll, what I do is, and I... <laughs> Law has turned me into this person. I was never this person. But when the exams come and you get the, you usually get like the week before the allocation of marks for the exam. And I will set a timer, you know, you divide the two hours, you give yourself 15 minutes of reading time, then divide the two hours according to the allocation of marks and set a bunch of timers. And then I just answer to the timers. And as soon as it hits you know zero I sort of ruthlessly go I have to move on to the next question because as Grace said it's better to muddle your way through the whole exam than to be a perfectionist about question one and then miss the second half of the exam altogether yeah yeah I actually name my alarms so like I I work better in the afternoon so I'll start at two o'clock and at two o'clock it says like download exam and I like name it and then um it's like reading time starts now right and then 15 minutes later it's like start question one <laughs> and, and it just has like question one question one b or whatever it is all the way through and I make sure that I have one there for submitting as well and do not leave submitting to the last minute like I know so many people do this but don't do it it's um, me seriously give yourself the time just in case <laughs> I totally submitted my last exam with less than a minute 45 left. Do not do that. I still have trauma from that moment. Um, I submitted yeah. my CRIM exam at 
two hours, 29 minutes, 59.87 seconds. And I cannot tell you how much I thought I was about to die. Don't do it. It's, it's the biggest mistake. <laughs> I actually thought I was going to pass out. <laughs> All right, um, and there's one more question. What wouldn't you include in your notes? Like what's one, some, yeah, what's something that you wouldn't ever add? Uh, for me personally, I wouldn't, it, I wouldn't put massive slabs of text in the notes. Like just kind of have it key and concise because if you have everything in there and you want to have it perfect sometimes and you just have like every little detail, it can get, over the top and you don't need all those details sometimes like you need a lot of them but if you have too much it can just really mess up the rest of the things and it's just better to have it concise not having too much information because having too much is just not so great it's not the best all the time yeah because i mean that's that's part of it isn't it sorry sorry guys sorry guys uh, uh i was just saying that's part of it like knowing what to include and what to leave out is like what you're being marked on Um, I would just like to add something in, in preparation for the session tonight, we actually got some feedback from a lecturer at RMIT and they said that one of the um, issues they come across sometimes is people just pasting in their model answers to um, previous questions that they've been asked and they've been using their notes to answer them. Don't just paste in your model answers. <laughs> um, definitely use your notes to draft your model answers, but I would keep those two things separate. Um, yeah. You want to make sure that you are actually answering the exam question. So that's one thing I would. Can I add on that? Um, yeah. For everyone who's done an exam before, you might have noticed that they've just recently added in word limits on the timed exams. So like the 3000 word limit. The reason they did that was, would you believe it? There was a bunch of students who may or may not have been uh, copying slabs of legislation and slabs of text into the answer and Whilst I know everyone in the room would never consider doing anything like that at all, um, there's a reason that they've implemented that word limit and that's that's it. People were literally just copying slabs of legislation and that's not how to answer an essay question. Exam question or an essay question. Yeah, those, those are really great tips. <laughs> um, and then we have another question from Hannah. Um, how much time would we allow to upload the completed exam? I think the official, the official. Oh, you, like, you can go, Grace, if you want. Like, no, 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 that's all right. We've answered it in the chat as well. And I think uh, Anders has pointed it out um, that, yeah, generally there's 15 minutes of reading time, uh, two and a half hours for the exam. And this is maybe not the same across all of the exams. So, like, don't take this as gospel, but. Um, but yeah, and then 15 minutes to um, upload it. And they've given an extra half hour basically to um, allow for these um, exams to be online I, or, or an extra 15 minutes. Um, and yeah, the reason is for, for uploading, downloading and that sort of thing. So when we go back to in-person exams, they won't be as long, most likely. Yep. Um, does anyone have any more questions? Uh, there is another one from Minaj, um, which is, do you usually do exam notes throughout the semester or do them in the lead up to exams? Um, for me personally, it can take a while for um, me to figure out how I'm going to structure them for a given subject because it can change. Again, um, depending on the lecturer, depending on expectations, um, yeah, depending on the particular issues. So I sometimes take a few weeks to get started, but by mid-semester break, I have definitely started um, because I find it a bit too stressful to, um, to do it to the level that I like to do it um, in, in the weeks leading up to the exam. So I would, I would try to spread it over the semester as much as possible, noting, of course, that you know, it might take a little while to get started. Uh, for me, I like to kind of, do them similar around like Grace does. Um, but what I like to do is I like to have my notes initially, which just has chock full of information. And then I like remake them again for the final exam. Cause then I can just pick key pieces of information, which I think are really useful or stuff that's there. Cause a lot of times I'll make my notes and I realize this isn't actually that important. No one really cares about that. Um, or certain things are more important and you need to have them. 
And from there, I just choose those key pieces and I'm able to put them in a new document and just put everything there. Uh, it just makes it a lot cleaner. And also it um, makes you memorize the notes because the problem is if you look at notes, which you've used from ages ago, or um, like months or so, it can be a bit not so easy to know what you not just written, but also like memorize the cases because you not haven't seen them in a while. So you might forget what's happened or forgot what it is. And so it's a lot easier if you kind of just refresh yourself. Cool. There's another one from Kristen. Um, so she, she said that uh, notes are great for my learning, but I haven't found that they assist me to anticipate the types of questions that will be on the exam. How might I be able to use my notes to help prepare for what might be on the exam? Um, again, I would <laughs> advise you to um, contact your lecturer and you know find out what kind of exam it is. Usually, in my experience, at least they've been problem-based. So there's this scenario and it's very complicated and there's multiple characters and they're all off doing different bad things because bad things always happen in exams. Um, and what you're doing is you are trying to spot issues. Uh, and that's why I structure my notes by issue. So if somebody has, you know, um, broken a glass, I think about, um, well, what does that what does that mean? That the issue there is conversion or, you know, something like that. Um, and then I know to go to conversion in my notes and copy and paste that and that gets me started. Um, and then I can start doing the analysis for that. So um, that is, I mean, that I, I anticipate that the issues that have been brought up in the course content <laughs> is what's going to come up in the exam. So um, yeah, that's, that's my best answer for that. But if anybody wants to add to that, feel free. <laughs> If you want to know what kind of questions that, like what sort of topic areas they might be looking at, look, there's no way of being able to be sure about it. Um, they could ask you anything from week one through to the end. But I've found that by looking at what the assignment one and assignment two are and what they're asking you um, and what topics they're covering, and then looking at what topics those assignments didn't cover, you will usually be asked a question about something that has not yet been covered in an assessment at some point during the exam. So be prepared to um, address something that has not as yet been um, assessed. And that's a good way of being able to make sure that you're, um, you know, that you're covering everything. The other thing that I would um, suggest, this is actually coming from my mother, who is an English teacher. Um, she would ask her students, what is the question you fear the most? What is the one that if you get into an exam, you will just panic um, and then find the answer for it and write it out. Um, and once you've been able to address the question that scares you the most, then the rest of it becomes a little less scary. On the back of that, do you have any advice on, let's say you're looking at the exam and you're reading the question and you're like, yes, they are all words that I recognise, but I cannot pick a single issue from anything that is happening there. Do you have a way that you sort of tackle that beyond sort of, I mean, like I kind of just like look at the modules that we've done each week and I'm like, which one is it? Do you have anything beyond that that you would suggest? Well, that's the benefit of the flow chart for me because it allows me to go through the process um, and check off my list um, and, and see what's working and what's not. So if I'm asking myself questions and going, okay, well, has this happened and has that happened and has this happened? Um, and if I'm able to then follow through the flow chart, then that's helpful. Um, in my criminal law exam, for example, um, we had a case where someone died. And of course, everyone who's on a criminal law exam will go, okay, well, most people will look at it and go, oh, well, that's clearly negligent manslaughter. And then you go through the process, and you're like, oh, no, it's not. Okay, well, what could it be? And then you go through, you know, all the other ones and then you get to, you know, it just becomes a bit of a mess. So if you can go through that process by following a flow chart or following your own checklist or whatever process you look at, it'll help you to narrow down what the issue is. And by breaking it down into those questions, then it allows you to find the issue um, that you're trying to deal with here. So if someone's dead, obviously there's going to be something relating to that. If someone's injured, then you'll be looking at something relating to that. So look at what the action was that happened. What did the one person do to the other? Um, or what did one person do that caused such and such an outcome? 
um, and go from there. Yeah, great answer, Zoe. And I just want to add that sometimes you don't know how you're going to conclude on a certain question until you're halfway through. Um, and that's why having those processes really help. It just means that you, you know, you're checking everything off and you're not wasting any time. You're just going through the process. And don't do what I did and start writing out the answer because you look at it and you go, oh, that is clearly negligent manslaughter. And so you go through them, the flow chart and you're writing your answer and you're really proud of yourself until you get to the last bit and you go, that's not right. And then you think, okay, well, I've wasted all that time. So now I'm going to go on to the next one. And then before you know it, you spend 45 minutes going through every possible crime that is connected to death before you get to the right one. So I find that... I try very hard to not get ahead of myself and to use my flowcharts um, to be able to go through the whole process first. Um, and I actually find that, or I anticipate that when, if, if and when we go back to face-to-face -to -face, um, exams, having a sheet of paper that's a flowchart like that might actually be easier um, to refer to for the exams as well, because you can see the process you have to go through and the questions you have to ask yourself. Um, and that just makes it a little bit easier me anyway. Yeah, so it seems to see that flowcharts and just organizing your notes are literally the best for exams. Um, does anyone have any last questions? Looks like we're pretty good, but I would just really like to thank the LSS for supporting this session today. Um, it's been a great collaboration between you and the uh, peer mentors. So thank you for uh, bolstering our attendance and um, everybody just go and sign up to Vigo now. <laughs> yeah. It'd be great to see you on there. Yeah, and I also want to thank you as well, you know, the whole peer mentors and all the effort that all, all you four did today um, and the weeks coming up to this event. So I really appreciate you guys as well. Um, so just to show our gratitude, um, if everyone could just put on the camera or just put a little emoji just to show our appreciation to these four um, peer mentors. So that's me. <laughs> Um, I'll also put in the link for the peer mentor. So if anyone's interested, please, please, please look at this link. What they do at peer mentor is, is very beneficial for everyone. Um, and yes, um, I'll also add a quick survey. This is completely optional um, because this, since this is the first event, we just want to make sure that we can get as much feedback as we can. So we would also appreciate that. Um, Oh, and also one other thing, um, which is just aside from this event, is that the LSS is also hosting a little event, um, event type of thing tomorrow, which is um, an online card game called a Cards Against Humanity. Um, if you are an LSS member, you can get a free Uber Eats voucher if you come along. So there is a little link on our socials. If you don't have any socials, please just let us know and we can provide you with that link and those sources. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Thank you all for attending and thank you all for your hard work again, peer mentors. And yeah, I think that's a Thanks, wrap. <laughs> all right, have a good night, everyone. Good luck. Thanks.